Hey everyone, welcome to Princess Gay. I'm your host, Connie, and today we are here with episode five? Six of Hell's Paradise. I had to make sure because I, I I wasn't 100% if I was remembering that episode five was the one we left off on or was the one that we are on now. So we're on episode six of Hell's Paradise. Um, and it's... It's always hard having to wait for these episodes because I, I'm loving this series so much. And every time I, I, I get to this, I'm like so excited, but then I wait to get to more. <laughs> like I, I, I reacted to this last Tuesday to episode five. And I wanted to get to more at multiple points during the week, but I, I, I kept convincing myself, no, I should get to other stuff instead. I ended up doing two episodes uh, of uh, My Adventures with Superman last week. Yet I didn't do a second episode of Hell's Paradise, even though I wanted to. Because I just felt like t doing other stuff instead. <laughs> um... And, and, and kind of the wackiest part about it is the entire thing that I said that this not having a schedule was all about. The opportunity for me to react to whatever I want, whenever I want. I have a certain list of shows, my slots, but I could choose when to get to things. And that can include multiple weeks without something and that can include uh weeks where i get to the same thing multiple times and yet i still have this i still have this weird thing in my head that is trying to convince me i need to make sure i get to everything every week and it's 100 percent i 100 percent believe that it is um something that was ingrained into me growing up this idea that I have to please everyone. Because there, there's, there's this idea that is just like forced into a lot of our heads when we're young. That we have to do whatever we can to be a people pleaser. To um, make sure that everybody's happy. And it, it was drilled into me so much, not just here at home and everything, um, but at school and places too. It's like the idea is like you should always be trying to make other people happy. And because of the, it, it's almost like, it, it's almost like this just weird compulsion in me nowadays to where it's like, if I don't get to a show for weeks, I'm going to disappoint the people who are waiting for the next episode. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I, I'm going to leave a bad impression and people are going to get upset for having to wait. And they're going to unsubscribe. And it's like, I go down this entire rabbit hole of anxiety and it's just, so it, it's, it's, oftentimes hard for me to just to do what I want when I want like this and I'm trying I'm trying to do better with that and it's like I don't I, I don't want to just like disappoint people by like waiting and, and and sometimes it happens anyway like it's been a couple weeks since we did Symfo gear and the reasoning for that has simply been I haven't been in the mood to get to it since then. Um, if I look here at my uh, schedule, I, I write I, I write down on a on a document like everything I react to when, so I can like make sure how long it's been and everything. Um, the last time I actually reacted to Simfo Gear was during the donation reward appreciation week which was between July 31st and August 4th. And it was on the 4th that I reacted to episode 3 of Simfo Gear G. So last week and the week before, I didn't get to it. 
And I acknowledge that is entirely on me, but it's also because I wasn't feeling up for check, for specifically watching that. And it's like, but then it's like last week I couldn't bring myself to react to Hell's Paradise twice, yet for some reason could react to My Adventures with Superman twice. It's like my mind is just an absolute, just, I don't even know how to describe it. My mind makes no sense, let's put it that way. My mind makes no sense to where it's like, I can go multiple weeks now without getting to Simpho gear. But if I want to, like, get to a certain show more than once in a week, I feel really fucking bad about it. Um... Because I think the big thing is, like, if I do... Like, if, if I were to, let's say, for example... Let's say this week I was feeling up to and wanted to do, let's say, three episodes of this series, of Hell's Paradise, over the course of the week. Um, I would feel bad that I was taking those, that time away from recording other stuff. My mind would, like, be saying, like, I want to get to this, but also, you're gonna feel bad about it. And it's just, it's, it's this weird fucking thing, and I, 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 I can't properly describe it. I've never been able to properly understand why my mind works this way. And I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. And I'm sorry for spending all this time at the beginning of this video just talking about this, but I, I think I'm going to continue to try to do the what I want when I want kind of situation with this all. Oh. And today, I want to get to this next episode of Hell's Paradise. So, if I want to end up getting to more of this this week, I'm going to try to push past my anxieties about like not getting to other shows and whatnot. But I probably won't be able to push past it completely. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. It's just, I've also been doing pretty well lately in terms of recordings. It's like I haven't had much trouble getting to stuff. Uh, in terms of like, oh, I'm recording pretty much each day. I, I'm not really having trouble. That's why I added the eighth slot and everything. Um, because I felt comfortable enough that I was getting to shit. We'll see how things go. <laughs> well, we'll see how things go. And I'm sorry for ranting on about this for so long. Um, but I needed to, I, I feel, just let this out. Um, but, anyway. Last time on Hell's Paradise, um, the sexist pig was killed. Um... We saw at the end, uh, big bad giant dude who already killed Aizen, or Aizen? I think it might be Aizen. It might be Aizen, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce a lot of things. Um, Sagiri's mentor. Um, and I think he was one of the highest ranked of the Asaimon as well. Uh, but either way, he was very brutally and violently and suddenly killed by big bad giant man. And now Big Bad Giant Man has also killed the sexist pig, who is, you know, another Asaimon. So this guy has a little bit of a, little bit of a track record going with killing Asaimon. Um, but now he's probably going to be, I would assume, after Sagari, since she's right there. Um, and I assume the others are going to have to come and help her fight him off. He's going to be, I feel like, one of the tougher ones to face, so I'm surprised that they're coming head-to-head -head with him so soon. He, he... He was kind of, like, billed as one of the strongest, and 
like build this like eating bears head first and shit it's like how do you fight a guy like this whose swords don't seem to work on at least if uh Aizen is any uh anything to go by and, and considering how strong he was we know he was actively one of the strongest to Simon yeah that's saying something um I don't know like will Will Gabimaru's ascetic blaze work well against him? Maybe that'll help. Uh, Gabimaru was stated in episode 2 to be the strongest of the Red Seals. To be the most dangerous of the prisoners who were in that encampment. Um, so it's very possible that he could defeat this guy. In fact, I'd even say probable. But the question is, how is he going to do it? And will he will he need some assistance in it? Because he might be stronger, but he it also might be just a barely situation. Like, he's barely stronger. I'm just wondering how this is going to go. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of questions that come from having this fight basically only halfway through the season so actually yeah halfway through the season this is episode six there's 12 episodes right maybe 13 either way still halfway point that kind of interests me as to what then is going to happen throughout the rest of the season if this is the halfway point hmm I guess still just fighting the demon creatures on his island and stuff. I mean, there could definitely be a step up from there. I don't know. We'll, we'll see, obviously. Um, but I'm interested to see how this fight goes. I, I'm definitely interested to know more about Big Bad uh, Giant Man. So, let's find out. When the screen fades to black, pause this redirect and go to the description below. Follow the link to the reaction, and after you watch it, come back here to the redirect and resume play. Because after it fades to black and then fades back in, everything from that point forward will be my afterthoughts and will contain spoilers to the episode. So, with that being said, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you at the reaction. And we are back, and we'll begin with spoilers in 3, 2, 1, now. This show never stops surprising me with, with how it leaves off episodes. It's like, most of this episode is, I, I feel, pretty self-explanatory. It's mostly just the fight. But then at the end, we see, like, the brothers, and they're, you know, the ones drinking blood to try and, you know, survive and everything. Um, pretty, pretty fairly understood. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of great symbolism and whatnot in this with the imagery, a lot of great character work. Um... But then you suddenly get the ending of this, and it's like, oh, did you want uh, sexy naked ladies m making the fuck out while their bare tits are, like, nipple to nipple with each other? It's like, here you go. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> What in the fucking tone shift is this? Like... <laughs> Listen, listen, I've talked about, I've talked about fan service in anime before and how I feel like fan service can be used to good effect, whether to properly tell a story to, used for the sake of progressing character work. Um, used in, you know, reasonable situations, stuff like that. Uh, but it can also be used for the sake of itself, just because, you know, haha, sexy uh, girl characters. Let's just have needless fan service for the sake of it. Um, and, and a lot of times that can be very distracting from the main story of everything. This the fan service here is unquestionably fan service you see a girl take a bite of a peach that is so unreasonably juicy and and then you see her making out 
sharing the peach between their mouths as they uh, practically are sucking on each other's tongues. And then it like goes over their bodies and everything. They're they're wearing like scraps of clothing basically. Um it's like ribbons basically. It's it, that's basically what it is, ribbons and I think they're wearing like a little bit over their lower halves. But like their tits are full on out and pressed together here. Like when it's scrolling um up on them, you see the one girl's like full ass crack. They are very much holding each other like aggressively sexually. Also, the creepy look they give at the end is fantastic, by the way. Um, so what do I think of this fan service? I think this is, uh, depending on what happens with it next episode. I think this could be some of the best executed fan service I've seen in anime. I'm not even kidding you. Be it's very sex sexual. It's exceptionally detailed. But the reason I say it could be some of the best, depending on what they do with it next episode, is because of how fucking out of nowhere it is. It doesn't fit with the rest of the series, but in a purposeful way that it feels wrong. It feels exceptionally terrifying. Because it's like, we we have this island where the only people who should be on this island are the ten prisoners, the ten Asaimon, and then corpses of previous people who were sent here. Right? So suddenly, amongst the ruins of the, the Buddhist and Taoist statues of this island that also have been questioned about why are these here? These are very much man-made. Amongst all of this, amongst all the monsters and strange bugs and everything we've seen, amongst all the death and violence and horror, suddenly it focuses on two seemingly normal looking almost completely naked extremely hot women making out right after the one guy talks about um Shinsenkyo is that that Shinsenkyo is supposed to be the home of these immortal hermits this comes across as fucking terrifying to me. These girls are, without a question in my mind, bad guys. Um, I, I don't know if I would say that they're monsters. I, in fact, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that they are people, that they are human. But they also might, you know, have partaken of the elixir of immortality. Um... And I very much think that they are, like, enemies here. The way they're introduced, especially the way that they look at the camera at the end, uh, or towards the brothers, more, like, more accurately. Like, they have these, like, fucking horrifying-looking expressions. They look like they are about to murder the shit out of these two. Like, it is genuinely frightening. That is how you do fan service. You make it, especially in a series like this specifically, you make it seem unnatural and terrifying. In, in a show like this, obviously. In a show like, I don't know, fucking Fire Force. That wouldn't make sense to do it in that way in a show like that. Um, I've talked about the fan service in that show, though, so I, I don't need to cover that again here. Um, but in a show like this that is a very horror-based show, using fan service to accentuate the foreignness, the the threatening aura, the just situational uh, already existing scares of this island to make it seem extremely unnatural and 
off <laughs> is so genius. Because it's like the only other times we've really had fan service, you could call it, or, or nudity in this series. There's only been really two other examples. One was with Sagri, and that was used as symbolism to show her vulnerability, which is also a phenomenal way to use fan service, by the way. Using it in a symbolic way as vulnerability is classic. It's been done throughout the history of media, and it's an amazing way to use fan service. And the only other time we saw it was a very brief moment with uh, the one young girl, and that was that was mostly used as a really quick one-off joke. Um, and it was it was very much like a you know typical anime joke. Oh, this character is actually a girl. We didn't know this, and everything. It's like so we show her naked despite her being twelve. Um. To kind of make that joke, even though it doesn't show anything, and her Asaimon monitor is very much against her being naked there, which I, I have to give him credit. He very much did not even try to peek or anything. He was he's a good dude. He genuinely was uncomfortable with her being like that. He's genuinely a good person in that regard. Um and and the reason she was like you know she disrobed in the first place was to clean her clothes it was a reasonable like reason for her to be naked there it made sense so it, it wasn't even that bad um but this is like the, now the third instance of there being um nudity and 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 all in this and really the first time that it's been shown as sexual the first and only time that the nudity in this series has been expressed sexually and again it's it's being displayed as being so frighteningly off compared to everything else that's been happening everything else around them everything surrounding these characters that it's 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 just so perfectly executed and again it's going to completely depend on what they do in the next episode and what i mean by that is how are they going to handle these two characters? It, uh, are these girls going to be bad guys like I believe them to be? Because based on all the evidence we see here, they very much come across as evil. And if, if they end up being good, and like actually being good, not like tricking uh, our, our characters into thinking that they're good, um, if they actually end up being good, I think that would take a lot away from this. It wouldn't ruin it completely, but it's just like, again, we know there's not supposed to be anyone else on this island. And especially not women. Like, that's, that's even more so the case. So... This is very much something that seems unnatural and scary. It, it, it would be... I, I feel it would make more sense for them also to be bad because of that. Um, and again, it mentioned, like, along with seeing the, the village, it mentioned that the, the original inhabitants of Shinsenkyo were supposed to be these hermits, these immortal hermits, who they pictured as like old men and everything which i mean i guess if there was an entire group of people living here initially then they're very possibly were old men <laughs> but i'm wondering if these two are like some of the original inhabitants and if there are others living here and if so why are so many of them gone why did the why did that village look abandoned why are there now these demonic monsters all around what it what has caused shinsenkyo to be this hell because it, it very much seems like this is not how it was originally was these monsters and creepy bugs and everything weren't originally here that's the vibe I'm getting from this now. 
So I'm very curious. Because they said that there weren't supposed to be monsters here. They actively said that here. So I'm very curious. This has just raised my, my, my interest in this series like tenfold. <laughs> um, but let's talk about Roku Roku. Uh, Raku Roku? Something like that. Big, big giant, uh, big giant man. Um, this dude is a literal baby. A literal man baby. Dude's like probably gotta be what, in his 30s or 40s, I would say? Maybe 50s? Maybe. But I, 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 I actually don't think he's that old. The, the point is, this dude was always big, he was always eating, always trying to play, and his play was a little bit aggressive. He was also born with insane strength. And we soon find out that as he was growing up, he his play and eating got more aggressive. He started to, it, it showed him eating an animal. I, I don't know if it was a dog or a cat. I could not tell in that moment. But um, it showed him carrying like a dead animal that he was like eating. And then it showed like, I assume who were his parents laying down the ground dead and having holes in them from him playing with them. And he grew up not like being not have because he killed his parents and everything when he was so young and everything he never grew up learning he never like grew up he never aged outside of physically his mind was kept in like this childlike baby-like state to the point where all he wanted to do was play and eat and so i was wrong when I said that he had murderous intent, it, it made it very clear that he didn't. He was playing. He genuinely was playing. And he did, he clearly doesn't even understand what death is, I feel. I, I feel that's pretty clear. It, it's kind of made to seem like when the people he plays with dies, it, it seems like he thinks that they're leaving him. Or refusing to play with him or something like that. He clearly doesn't understand the concepts of right and wrong. So he has absolutely zero issue eating people. He, he's, he's just a violent, playful baby who doesn't know better. And is too strong for his own good. I don't even think he fully understands that when people are attacking him that they're doing so to hurt him. I don't think he understands that. Which is wild to think about. Because I've, I've seen characters like this in, in, in media before, but not, not usually to this notable of a degree. Not to where, one, they're this exceptionally violent and horrifying, but also to where they're not usually, like, this much of an actual baby, pretty much. And in the end, even though Sagari and uh, Gabimaru didn't, like, get that backstory that we got, I think Sagari almost kind of felt it with him. Because at the end, she was coddling his head, which, by the way, is really wild of a statement to make. <laughs> she was coddling his head and, and talking to him like a baby. Like, like, a, like a mother would talk to a baby. And she closed his eyes to give him peace and everything. She was, I mean, I feel like she was just respecting him as a warrior and everything. But it's like... I feel like she almost had this kind of instinct that told her. Um, and I'll get to more with Sagari in a moment. But this character is fascinating to me. That they, that they took this route. Instead of making him a giant, murderous, crazy, like, criminal, he's just a poor, lost child who just does not understand what he's doing. And it's almost kind of sad, honestly. Because it's like, again, there's no murderous intent. There's no negative 
feelings he has towards any of these people. He's literally a giant baby who, who just who just wants to play, who wants to eat, who who doesn't understand why everybody is, again, quote unquote, leaving him or refusing to play and everything. It's it, it recontextualizes everything we knew about his character before this, which, mind you, wasn't a lot, but still. It's, it's very interesting. And by the way, this does not by any mean, like, minimize his crimes. He, without question, is a murderer. Like, even if he's a baby and doesn't understand, he is still a murderer. But it, it's just such an interesting character. Um, also, we see... Uh, Yuzuriha is just not willing to get involved in these fights. Like, she just flat out refuses and instead cheers Gabimaru on. Um, it's, it's wild. Basically excusing it by saying her part in the deal is to give information, not fight. Which technically is true, but at the same time it's like, bitch, come on. <laughs> um... Like, she, she's wild for that one. It's like... I, I want to see her fight as well. I know her, her entire thing is more, like, tricky kind of maneuvers and stuff. And, like, manipulating her, her victims. But still. I would like to see her in actual combat. And I think her and Gabimaru fighting together would be cool, since they're both shinobi. Um, but yeah, that's the majority of the episode. Just this fight. But during this, we get just so much more great character with, work with Sagari. Um, I, I've talked about how, how great the character work in this series is before, with how much it delves into the depths of these characters, what they're thinking, what's just going through their heads at any given moment, and how it changes their ideologies and beliefs and core values. And it's, it's a major part of this episode. Sagri having to come to terms with, accept, and utilize her core ideology of walking the middle ground. And, and, and some people would, would say that you shouldn't do this. And it depends on the situation. It depends on the ideologies and everything. This is a situation where it's, I feel, not only, um, not, not only a good thing to do, but outright necessary. Because the middle ground she's walking is between logic and emotion between reason and feeling. You, and, and I agree with this fully, you cannot abandon either. To, to act solely on reason, on logic, like, you will hold yourself back. And which she has been doing, actively. We, we've seen this at many points. And it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why she's the lowest ranked. Because, as was put by the other Simon, she's, um... She's, uh... What would the word be? She's reasonable to a fault. Let's just say reasonable there. That wasn't the word I was trying to think of, but... She's reasonable to a fault. It's to a point where she actually holds herself back and, and puts herself in danger and stuff like that because she's not think she she's thinking but nothing else. And you can't act solely on emotion, because if you act solely on emotion, then you're going to make mistakes. You're going to trip up. You're going to attack when you shouldn't. And 
it's going to get you killed. Acting on either one of those alone will end in death in this kind of situation. Combining them, though, using reason in order to understand what to do, when to do it, what's the best moves and all that, with emotion that keeps you human, keeps you just acting on just general feeling, they blend together perfectly to allow for a more concise, real, human experience. And even Genji, in the end, understands this. Genji, the guy who was exceptionally sexist last episode, who was literally telling Sagri to get back into the kitchen and make him a sandwich. Like, literally that kind of energy. Um, telling her that she should go home and bear children for the clan and not be a warrior because she's a woman. Literally for that reason. She even tries to explain herself to him last episode, and he still just kept on with that and even attacked her. But at his dying moments, he turned himself around. He recognized her. He recognized her choice to walk the middle ground, not only acknowledging it, but accepting it and encouraging it. He understood he was wrong. And yeah, part of that could possibly be because he was dying. Of course. It's like, it, does it really mean as much for a guy to admit that he was being a sexist asshole to a woman only when he's dying? I could see why you would say no. <laughs> but at least he admitted it. There's a lot of people who go to their graves with, while never disavowing their sexism they carry that to their graves and so if he if it takes him dying to accept it at least he accepted it at least he understood and turned himself around and viewed sagri in the end as an equal he he saw her conviction he saw what she was trying to do, and he accepted and encouraged that. I will give him insane credit for that. So much more credit than I would give a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, we had the ending. We see the brothers a little bit more. Um, hopefully we get to see more of them next episode because a lot of these other side characters admittedly need a little more screen time, I feel. That would probably be my only complaint so far. Um, especially the, the ones we focused on, I guess, would be the bigger uh, examples of that. Uh, so I guess specifically the brothers and then the little girl, I can't remember her name right now. And her monitor as well. Those, those four, I feel, need more screen time here. And I, I believe they will get it. But I, I understand who our main characters are and why we're following them more exclusively. I understand. But I just want a little more screen time for these other characters too. And we have, hopefully, a, enough time for that in the second half of the season. But yeah, that ending... Um, again, could be one of the best examples of fan service in anime. N again, not really counting something like an ecchi series, which is literally built on its fan service. Because ecchi series, or even straight up hentai, it's like, that's literally the point of the series. <laughs> you can't really count that. Uh, that's not really fan service in that case, because it's like, it's just part of what it is it's it's almost practically porn 
just with a plot. Um, but in terms of like a, a, a regular anime series with fan service, again, one of the best examples I've seen. Easily. And I'm very interested to see how this goes. And I'm really hoping my prediction is right. I'm really, really hoping that these two are frightening bad guys. They don't have to necessarily be the strongest or anything. But I, I just, even if they're just there to herald the possibility of more of more enemies like them in the future, who shouldn't, again, should not be there in Shinsenkyo, that's enough for me to where it's like, oh yeah that could be good like like for example like what if they attack the brothers the brothers kill them really easily but it's like if if these two exist here and shouldn't be here and maybe even just aren't normal let's say they're not normal humans exactly then what else could be here it it, it raises that question and it builds that fear and anticipation and it's, it's just so good I really hope this lives up to my hopes and expectations because if it does, that's going to skyrocket this series for me. I'm not kidding you. If, if this truly lives up to my expectations and hopes with these two girls, it will skyrocket this series up in the rankings for just my favorite anime and I guess favorite series in general. Um because it's just so well set up here it's just it's gotta right it's gotta and the funny thing is it's not even just about how sexy they are in fact that's actually kind of a second thought here it's just how out of nowhere and creepy they fucking are it's like even just let me go back to this because it's not they're not they're not, not just like standing in the middle of the woods or anything either like there's this like statue or something let me see if i can try to get a good view of it okay it seems like there's multiple statues here some like are like totem like uh one looks like it's like a giant head of a statue or something with vines wrapped around it and they're like on top of the like the vines or tree roots or whatever there, there's like some smaller totem like statues around it there's one that looks like like praying hands which would make sense with the buddhist and taoist inspired things around there it might have been like a bigger statue at one point but like broken down it looks like it might have been broken but they're on top of it again wearing almost nothing making it's like just the setup of that shot is so fucking eerie they're on these statues that are man-made, and we, we've already gone over how we know that they're man-made. They're on these statues, surrounded by the lush beauty and nature-esque visuals of Shinsenkyo. Having the most sensual makeout session possible. If you do not see this and are not fucking creeped out by this, like, I, if you're not creeped out by this, I'm sorry, you have Will of Steel or something. Because that is fucking terrifying. There is just something so unnatural about how that is set up. Again, even before it, like, goes in and shows, like, the details, even with them just in small detail in the wider shot of the entire statue and everything, it is so fucking creepy. It is so unnerving. It is so good in that regard. But yes, I, I cannot deny they are both excessively sexy. Which is also very concerning in a weird way. They are like too perfect. Like they are too perfectly sexy. Also one of them, like the pink haired one, her hair looks like a flower. Like a flower bud. Is that just me? The, the blonde hair just looks like just a regular hairstyle i guess but the the pink haired one her hair looks like a flower bud like um i guess cherry blossoms would be the first thing that comes to mind 
it's just I am so excited for where this is gonna go I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how how just good this anticipation is right now um, but I want to hear your thoughts I genuinely want to know what you think of this as well so Tell me in the comments below, what did you think of this episode of Hell's Paradise? What do you think of the fight against Roku Roku? Roku Roku? Something like that. Whatever the fuck the big giant man's name is. Um, tell me what you think of um, Sagri's character arc and how that's been continuing to work in this episode. And let me know your thoughts on that ending as well. Like, I really want to know your thoughts on how that ended and... If, uh, please tell me I'm not the only one who thinks that this is excessively creepy, right? Please tell me that you, you, you thought that too. Obviously no spoilers for the future, but yeah. Let me know your thoughts on all of that and more in the comments below. And for now, I'm Connie and I'm signing off. See y'all next time.